Good evening. Our spring 2005 lecture series continues with tonight's discussion, Essential Fatty Acid, the Fats for Good Health. My name is James Roberts. I'm board certified in internal medicine and in cardiology. I've been practicing clinical and invasive cardiology in the Northwest Ohio area for the last 19 years. I'm the medical director of comprehensive heart care, the EECP Center of Northwest Ohio, and AMRI, the Advanced Magnetic Research Institute of Northwest Ohio. I'll start with my conclusions. What are the benefits of fish oil supplementation in the patient with cardiovascular disease? First, your lipid panel improves. Your HDL rises, triglycerides and lipoprotein A falls, LDL particle size increases. Fish oil supplementation has an anticoagulant effect. Platelet aggregation, platelet monocyte aggregation are blunted, fibrinogen and PI1 levels fall, homocysteine falls, endothelial function improves, angina frequency and nitroglycerin requirements fall, treadmill time improves in coronary patients, two-year angiographic appearance improves. People who suffer with fish oil, this provides protection against future cardiovascular events, heart attack, stroke, unstable angina. Your vein grafts are less likely to close following bypass surgery. You're less likely to re-narrow following balloon angioplasty. Cardiac autonomic function improves. There's a decrease in the frequency of PVCs and protection against ventricular arrhythmias, protection against sudden death. Fish oils are preventative and therapeutic in atrial fibrillation. There's a major reduction in post-heart attack mortality if you supplement with fish oils and multiple non-cardiovascular benefits. Every organ system in the body will benefit from fish oil supplementation. What are the downsides or cautions? Fish oils can be oxidized. The unsaturated fatty acids can be oxidized. So you take antioxidants along with your fish oils. And that's why we have the antioxidant lecture first, followed by the fish oils. Fish oils have a beneficial effect on clotting. They prevent abnormal clotting. They don't cause abnormal bleeding, but there are certain situations where you want to clot really well, such as if you undergo neurosurgery. So we would ask you to hold your fish oils for several weeks. We need balance here. If we flood you with fish oils, which is omega-3, we can cause a deficiency in omega-6. So we'll supplement with omega-3 and omega-6. Fish oils contain vitamin A. You got to take an awful lot of fish oil to get too much vitamin A, but we keep it in mind. We want to keep your A intake below 30,000 units in adults, less than 10,000 units a day during pregnancy. Dietary fish contain mercury. We have, we have fouled the, uh, the waterways, and the fish, especially from the Great Lakes, are contaminated with mercury. This is a problem, and we have some solutions to that. Your insurance will not cover your fish oil supplements. You're going to have to pay for them out of pocket. And of course, the more my patients take antioxidants and fish oils, you know, unfortunately, they're getting healthier and healthier. And I don't have to do as many heart catheterizations as I used to. And I, I like doing heart catheterizations. I'm sure you all feel real sorry for me about that. <laughs> so my recommendations, eliminate trans fats from your diet. They're metabolic poisons. Margarine, partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, processed grocery store oils. These are all the things we like, the french fries, the donuts, the crackers, but they're toxic. Minimize saturated fat, cut back on meat and dairy, but saturated fat is, is not the major culprit. It's the trans fats that are the big problem. Emphasize dietary unsaturated fatty acids, unrefined trans fat free vegetable oils, cook with monounsaturated olive oil. For general health promotion, you've got a few options. Option one, two to three fish meals a week of a good high quality oily fish or you could take 1,000 milligrams a day of fish oil, or you could take a tablespoon of flaxseed oil to get your omega-3, and then gamma linolenic acid three days a week, which we get from eating primrose oil or a black currant oil. Another option is to take a blend of oils, such as Udo's Choice or Barleen's Omega Twin. They're designed to give you omega-3, omega-6 in a balanced format. If you have known cardiovascular disease, one of the problems that we'll talk about tonight 
I'm going to recommend the dose utilized in the studies that showed that fish oils were a benefit. These may not be the only doses, the best doses, but we try to be as scientific as we can. But the key here is you need to take a lot of fish oil. For heavy-duty cardiovascular problems, we're going to recommend that you take three to 5,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA a day. That's not three to 5,000 milligrams of fish oil. It's three to 5,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA. So we're going to probably recommend 10,000 milligrams a day of fish oil, which is why I'm going to recommend a tablespoon a day of fish oil which is the most cost-effective approach to get an adequate dose. And you have these doses on your handout. If we want to prevent the development of cardiovascular disease, or in a patient with known cardiovascular disease, if you want to stabilize the plaques, retard disease progression, protect you from uh, an adverse event, heart attack, stroke, the need for bypass surgery, we must identify and deal with your risk factors, everything that can cause cardiovascular disease. And a discussion of, of, of essential fatty acids is appropriate because if you suffer from essential fatty acid deficiency or excess of trans fats and you're out of balance, that leads to high homocysteine, low HDL, high triglycerides, high lipoprotein A, endothelial dysfunction, fibrinogen rises, your blood is viscous, your blood pressure goes up, and you have inflammation. Our diet consists of foodstuffs vitamins and minerals, and water. You know, we've already talked about vitamins and minerals. Not a lot to say about water. So we'll talk about foodstuffs. Now, protein and carbohydrate, that's another lecture. Tonight, we're going to talk about fats. Fats should make up 10 to 20% of our daily calories, but they make up more like 40 to 50% in Americans. Fats are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, Protein and carbohydrate will give us four calories per gram. Fats give us nine calories per gram, which is why fats are fattening. They're energy dense. The smallest particle of a fat is the triglyceride, shown here. This is a very small particle. Um, one quintillion triglycerides will fit in a drop of oil. That's one with 18 zeros. Common to all triglycerides is the three-carbon glycerol backbone. What makes a triglyceride good or bad, what makes a fat good or bad, is the composition of the three fatty acids bound to the glycerol. So we're talking about fats being good or bad. We're really talking about fatty acids being good or bad. So let's talk about fatty acids. We'll characterize them as saturated versus unsaturated, cis versus trans, essential versus unessential. This is a saturated fatty acid, steric acid. Fatty acids are really long chains of carbon. Now, in nature, carbon must exist with four bonds to adjacent molecules. In the saturated fatty acid, each carbon is attached to at least two hydrogens. So the carbons are saturated with hydrogen. Now, each hydrogen um, um, atom wants to repel all the others and push away. But in the saturated fatty acid, we have an equal number of hydrogens on each side of the carbon, so there's an equal and opposite force. So the saturated fatty acid will be straight. It will be linear. Now, linear molecules pack together well. Think if you take a box of pencils that's full and you shake it. The pencils don't move around very well. They pack well together. So if molecules aren't moving around quickly, that tends to make them a solid. So saturated fatty acids tend to be solid at room temperature. This is the fat that you'll cut off a piece of meat, or you're supposed to cut off a piece of meat, or dairy fat, butter. So saturated fats are solid at room temperature. We get them from animal and dairy sources. They raise our cholesterol and triglycerides. They cause obesity and heart disease. They have no unique nutritional value. They're only good as a source of energy. And we're going to suggest you minimize the intake of saturated fats. All they're good for is this a source of calories. Other than that, they're not very helpful. What's an unsaturated fatty acid? Here we have oleic acid, a monounsaturated fatty acid. Here there's one or more carbon to carbon double bonds. Carbon still has four bonds. It's happy. But here, these two carbons are bound to only one hydrogen, so it's unsaturated. 
Um, now here, these hydrogens are going to push away from one another. And here's a void. There's no hydrogens in here to push back. So oleic acid is going to have a V-shape. It'll have a bend. Gamma linolenic acid is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. It has three double bonds. Now, this is an omega-6 fatty acid. And we also talk about omega-3s. That has to do with the number of carbons in from the methyl group you have the double bond. This is the 6 carbon, so gamma linolenic acid is an omega-6. It's got three double bonds. Now, what does it look like? Think if you take a paper clip and you straighten it and bend it three times. It's going to have a strange configuration. If you take these bent molecules and put them in a box and shake it, they're going to move all over the place. They don't stick together well like a linear molecule, a saturated fatty acid. So these molecules are slipping and sliding all over the place, so they're going to be liquid at room temperature. We get them from vegetable oils, corn oil, safflower oil, linseed oil. The monounsaturates may have an antioxidant effect. Olive oil is rich in phenol. But all the unsaturated fatty acids lower your cholesterol, they lower your triglycerides, help prevent obesity and heart disease. These are good fats. Essential fatty acids. We're really taking fatty acids, not for the sake of taking fatty acids, but because we want a good mix of prostaglandins. Essential fatty acids are, are fatty acids that we must get from our diet to make these important prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are locally acting hormones, intracellular messengers. They mediate multiple physiologic processes, including fever, pain, inflammation, brown fat metabolism, blood platelet stickiness, and vascular tone. The American diet is deficient in healthful essential fatty acids, and it's unfortunately rich in essential fatty acid blockers like trans fats. Americans have an unhealthful prostaglandin mix. We're going to bypass this problem by supplementing with the beneficial essential fatty acids, the fish oils, and the beneficial omega-6s, like gamma linolenic acid. Cis versus trans. The healthful unsaturated fatty acids, they have a bend. This is called the cis configuration. And this is how um, uh, um, unsaturated fatty acids exist in nature while they're liquids. Now, about 100 years ago, the food processing industry had this big problem. They found that they could expel from seed grains, like soybeans or corn, they could, could, could express out their oil. And they wanted to find a market for this liquid, unsaturated fatty acid as, as, as part of our diet. And they really wanted to move in on the butter market and, and push the dairymen out. And they would market this material, and they would ask you to pour this on your toast in the morning as opposed to spreading butter. Well, Americans didn't like to do that. They were used to stick butter, a solid butter, so nobody was buying the, um, the corn oil or the safflower oil. So they wanted to find a way to convert the liquid unsaturated fatty acid into a solid. Well, the reason it's not a solid is because it's unsaturated. It doesn't have enough hydrogens. So if, if not enough hydrogen is the problem, we can fix that. So they would take the corn oil or the safflower or the soybean oil, put it in these big vats, heat it up, apply a lot of pressure, and then bubble in hydrogen gas. They're going to force extra hydrogens into here and convert the, um, the, the liquid, unsaturated fatty acid, into a solid saturated fat. And it worked. So they would convert the healthful, unsaturated liquid fatty acid into a saturated fat that would be a solid. And it tastes good. Saturated fats taste good. Um, so they accomplished their goal, but they didn't get it quite right. Um, they didn't always fully hydrogenate every double bond. Some of the particles, instead of becoming a saturated fat, what they did, they just rearranged the hydrogens. You go from the cis to the trans configuration. But that's not a problem, because now you've got an equal and opposite number of hydrogens. It's still a straight linear molecule. It'll be a solid, just like a saturated fat. And, it'll, and, and they could market it. And, and this made sense to them. But it introduced into the food supply a molecule that does not normally exist in nature. And they really should have 
put this through the FDA as a drug as opposed to the USDA as a food source. Because whenever we introduce molecules into humans that aren't supposed to be there, we may have some surprises. And this material is actually turning out to be a metabolic poison. It's very, very toxic. But what is this material that is made when we partially hydrogenate vegetable oils? What is the name of this stuff? Margarine. This is what margarine is. It's a metabolic poison. It's the most dangerous uh, food stuff in the grocery store. Don't eat this stuff. Well, the, what are the cardiovascular effects of these trans fats? Now, first of all, why am I complaining? The American Heart Association endorsed margarine. You can buy margarine. You get that little American Heart Association seal of approval. Now, they had to give the American Heart Association a lot of money, but still, the American Heart Association did endorse it. So why am I arguing with my, my peers? Well, I always argue with my peers, but why am I arguing now? <laughs> well, you know, there's TV ads. Remember, TV ads to protect your heart by eating margarine. You've all seen these. Well, they'll tell you that trans fats, margarine, reduce cholesterol compared to saturated fats, you know, uh, like butter. If you substitute trans fats, margarine, for saturated fats, say butter, as 10% of your calories, there'll be a 6% reduction in total cholesterol. Well, I shouldn't really complain about that. Replacing nutritional cis fats, corn oil, with man-made trans fats, margarine, doesn't increase cholesterol. Now, if you substitute saturated fats, butter, for unsaturated fats, corn oil is 3 to 10% of your energy, your bad LDL goes up, your HDL doesn't change, and your cholesterol rises. All right, that's why we would say corn oil is better than butter. Now, if you substitute these wonderful trans fats, man-made margarine, for nutritional unsaturated fats, corn oil, your cholesterol doesn't go up. So margarine won't make your cholesterol go up, your total cholesterol. What happens is, your good HDL falls a lot more than your bad LDL rises. The ratio is thrown off adversely, but the total cholesterol doesn't change. So when they say that margarine won't raise your cholesterol, they're not lying, but they're not telling you the whole truth. The mixture, the ratio of LDL to HDL goes out of whack. Trans fats do reduce cholesterol with other saturated fats. They lower HDL more than they raise the LDL, so the total cholesterol drops slightly, but the cholesterol to HDL ratio rises with this overall coronary risk. That would be bad enough, but trans fats raise lipoprotein A that we're going to talk about next week, the ugly cholesterol, by 25 to 50 percent, and they gum up prostaglandin mix, which we'll talk about in a moment. They are metabolic poisons. The intake of partially hydrogenated vegetable oils and fats, basically margarine, has paralleled the rise in coronary mortality in the U.S. and in Europe. The seven countries epidemiologic study, average intake of partially hydrogenated fats was associated with regional difference in coronary disease incidence. Dietary trans fat is associated with your risk of hypertension. The concentration of trans fats in your plasma is, is associated with the, your risk or your presence of cardiovascular disease. Adipose tissue trans fat, that's fat cell trans fat, is predictive of your risk of future cardiac death. Red blood cell membrane trans fat content is also predictive of your risk of sudden death. The U.S. Male Health Professional Study, we're going to look at trans fat intake and what effect it has on your future coronary event rate. The men in the highest quintile, the highest 20% bracket for trans fat intake, were 40% more likely to develop coronary disease than men with lower trans fat intake. The Nurses Health Study, we talked about that last week. That was the study that showed that nurses who habitually take in antioxidants have less cardiovascular disease. Here, the, the nurses in the highest um, quintile of trans fat intake, that's 3.2% of your calories. That's not a lot. If you're on a 2,000 calorie a day diet, that's just 60 calories, a few pats of margarine. As opposed to the nurses in the lowest quintile, their risk of a future coronary event increased by a third. Cookies, white bread, margarine, the primary culprits. The risk was not explained entirely by the adverse effect on LDL and HDL, 
But if you would factor in lipoprotein A and prostaglandins, then you would understand why trans fat intake is associated with such an increased cardiovascular risk. Here, let's measure plasma lipids and fatty acid levels in 47 patients with blocked arteries on their angiogram, 56 healthy controls free of overt disease. Now, the patients with coronary disease, their cholesterols were higher, their LDLs were higher, their HDLs were lower. Total fatty acids were higher. But if you break down the type of fatty acids, the most glaring difference between the coronary patients and the healthy patients was the coronary patients had a lot more trans fat in their blood than did the healthy people. If you, you could look for associations between trans, as your trans fat levels rise, you see that correlates with high cholesterol, high LDL, high triglycerides, low HDL, low omega-3, omega-6. Here, we're going to graph increasing percentage of fatty acids in the plasma that are trans fats versus the good essential fatty acids. The coronary patients are here. The healthy people are here. They've got more unsaturated fats. The coronary patients have more trans fats. So at any one point in time, if we sample your blood, the more trans fats you got, the more likely you are to have cardiovascular disease. How about looking into the future? Let's look at your habitual intake of trans fats and see how that relates to your future cardiovascular risk. Again, the Nurses' Health Study enrolled 80,000 healthy at the time um, U.S. female nurses. None had cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or high cholesterol. Every two years, each nurse completes a food frequency questionnaire to assess dietary habits and the intake of specific nutrients. You stratify the intakes into quintiles. You follow them for 14 years. There were about 1,000 heart attacks or cardiac deaths. We're going to relate health, health outcome to differences in long-term intake of different nutrients. At that time, this is 1980, the average uh, American nurse took in about 2% of her calories as trans fats. It's now up to 4 to 5%. Now, here we have the increasing quintiles of an intake of the food and the relative risk that's adjusted for other risk factors. Now, we've been saying that fat's really bad for you and you've got to lower your fat. So you'd expect the nurses in the upper quintile for total fat intake to have more heart disease than, than nurses with lower fat intake. That was not the case. The, the nurses in the upper quintile were only 4% more likely to have a cardiac event. Well, that doesn't fit the classic teaching. Oh, it must be animal fat. We all know that animal fat's bad, right? The nurses in the upper quintile of animal fat, their risk was actually a little bit less by 3%. Huh. Vegetable fat, that's where we get our healthful essential fatty acids that we make into prostaglandins. The nurses in the upper quintile, oh my goodness, they've got a 33% risk reduction. So vegetable fat's good. Saturated fat, the nurses in the upper quintile are only 7% more likely to have a problem. Monounsaturated fat had a weak protective effect. Polyunsaturated fats, which you get from vegetable oils, the nurses in the upper quintile, that decreases their risk by 32%. So it's total fats not a problem. Saturated fats aren't a health food. And I think the problem is you take a lot of saturated fat, there's not enough room in your stomach for the beneficial polyunsaturated fats from vegetable oils. The key point here is it's not too much saturated fat, it's not enough unsaturated fatty acids, not enough essential fatty acids. Now, Trans fats, you know, the nurses that got 60 calories a day of trans fats, their risk rises by 50%. Saturated fats aren't good for you. Trans fats are metabolic poisons. They'll kill you. So a little bit of trans fats is going to dramatically increase your cardiovascular risk. And high cholesterol only increased your risk by 17%. Trans fats are the culprit. Here we're going to look at your, your future coronary risk as a function of increasing trans fat intake or decreasing polyunsaturated fat, vegetable oil intake. Now, a lot of us have bad habits. I take in, I eat too much. I take in way too much carbohydrate. I know it's bad for me, but I'm going to go out and run, so I'm okay. So we can compensate for some of our sins, can't we? Well, some people will say, well, I like my French fries, and I like my margarine, 
and I'm going to eat that stuff, but to compensate, I'm going to take in fish oils you know, to, to neutralize them. It doesn't work that way. The more trans fats you take in, the greater is your risk. Here we have people who are taking in a lot of trans fats, and they're taking in a lot of good polyunsaturated fatty acids, thinking they can protect themselves, but there's no protection. Why is this? Because trans fats are a metabolic poison. The enzymes that will convert a good fatty acid into a good prostaglandin will grab the trans fat because the trans fat looks an awful lot like a good, healthful, and saturated fatty acid, but it's not. But the, it looks close enough, it's sort of a molecular mimicry. The enzyme will grab it, it can't convert it into a good prostaglandin because it's a trans fat, but like a key that's not quite right for the lock. It won't open the door, and then you can't get the key out. The trans fat won't let go of that enzyme. It'll kill it. So if you take in a lot of trans fats, the enzymes that are designed to convert the good fatty acids into the prostaglandins are all shot. So taking in plenty of fish oil won't protect you if you're taking in a lot of trans fats. It's like if you've got a lot of cyanide in your system, we can give you all the oxygen you want. You're still going to die because you can't use it. So think of trans fats like cyanide. Here we'll look at the change in relative risk of a future corneal event related to the substitution of a specific type of fat for dietary carbohydrate. If we substitute saturated fats for carbohydrates as 5% of your energy, your risk rises by 17%. If we drop 5% of calories as carbohydrate and substitute in monounsaturated fats like olive oil, your risk falls by 19%. If we give you polyunsaturated fatty acids like fish oils, your risk falls by 38%. If we substitute 2% of your calories, not, you know, that's 40 calories if you're on a 2,000 calorie a day diet, trans fats instead of carbs, a little bit of margarine, your risk doubles. So trans fats are a big problem. Cholesterol is nothing compared to trans fats. Here, estimated percent changes in risk with the isocaloric substitution of one dietary component for another. If we substitute carbs for saturated fats, your risk falls a little bit. If we substitute carbs for something good, polyunsaturated fat, your risk rises. If we get rid of trans fats and replace it with anything, your risk falls. Considering only the effects of trans fats on LDL and HDL and the ratio, dietary trans fat intake accounts for 7% of American coronary deaths. Reducing total dietary fat is not likely to reduce dietary trans fat. Why? 5 to 10% of the fat in the American diet, 5% of the fat stored in our fat cells, our adipose cells, is trans. Over the past decade, U.S. dietary fat intake has decreased from 38 to 34%, but trans fat intake has decreased only negligibly. We've been telling you cut back on fat, you're taking the message, but you're not cutting back on trans fats. Why? Because you've been misled and lied. Saturated fats taste good. Trans fats taste good. Unsaturated fats don't taste so good. The food manufacturers, they recognized a market was developing for low-fat foods. You want low-fat foods, you're willing to pay for them. But the problem is they don't taste so good. What the USDA allowed them to do was replace saturated fats with trans fats. And because trans fats are a man-made molecule, not a natural food stuff, the, the government allowed the food manufacturers to omit from the label the fact that trans fats were there. They treated it like a condiment. So this would taste good because it had trans fats. On the label, it would say low in saturated fats. No one bothered to tell you it was full of trans fats. You, the health conscious American, would buy it, but it really was much more toxic than eating the, trans, than, than eating the original product with saturated fats. That situation is just now changing. On the food labels, they have to look at they have to list the percentage of fats that are trans and trans fat calories. But look at those food labels. And if you see trans fats, partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, it's a metabolic poison. Avoid dietary trans fats as much as possible. 
partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, margarines, especially solid margarines, products baked or fried in hydrogenated fats, fast foods, French fries, donuts, potato chips, crackers, cookies, all the stuff that we like. It's just no good for you. Unless it's trans fat free. And use vegetable oils in their native unhydrogenated form for frying, baking, and at the table. <clears throat> Other adverse effects. Alter cell membrane transport and fluidity. Alter the size, number, and fatty acid composition of fat cells. Contribute to insulin insensitivity. They make you diabetic. Block metabolism of the beneficial unsaturated fatty acids. Lower antibody titers and enhances autoimmune responses. We'll talk about that later. Alter the activity of a liver enzyme that metabolizes carcinogens. Individuals on the highest versus the lowest quartile of fat tissue trans fatty acid content, they have a 40% greater likelihood of developing breast cancer. And I'd say cancer in general. Trans fats decreases your testosterone level, increases the percentage of abnormal sperm. That's not good for the future of our society. They interfere with pregnancy, correlate with low birth weight, lower the quality of breast milk. They're toxic to every aspect of our physiology and health. Now, how does this work? We're taking in these essential fatty acids to make prostaglandins. This is the biochemical flow chart. It's critical that physicians like myself understand this chart quite well. You don't have to understand it, but I want to run through it with you so you understand there's a biochemical basis for everything I say. Now, essential fatty acids are the fatty acids our body can't make. We have to get them from our diet. The parent essential fatty acid is linoleic acid that we get from vegetable oils. We have an enzyme called delta-60 saturase that will convert linoleic acid to gamma-linoleic acid, and then an enzyme will convert GLA to prostaglandins of the 1 series. These are good guys. They keep our platelets from sticking together. They dilate our blood vessels. They, they, block, they lower our temperature. They block pain. They promote weight loss. They're good guys. To some degree, we can take linoleic acid, corn oil, uh, safflower oil, soybean oil, and convert it to alpha-linolenic acid. But we don't do a really good job. So we really rely on our diet. Um, uh, mustard seed oil, walnut oil, flaxseed oil is rich in ALA. To a degree, we can convert the flaxseed ALA into EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, but we don't do a really good job of that. So we really rely on fish intake to get our EPA. The same enzyme that converts gamma-linolenic acid to, to the good guy prostaglandins of the 1 series converts the eicosapentaenoic acid from fish into prostaglandins of the 3 series that team up to do the good things. So you want prostaglandins of the 1 and 3 series. We can also make, convert gamma-linolenic acid to arachidonic acid. This is the bad guy. And think about arachidonic as spiders. Spiders are evil things. You don't like this. We get arachidonic acid from meat and dairy. The enzymes that convert GLA and EPA into the good prostaglandins may also convert arachidonic acid to prostaglandins of the 2 series. They cause our blood vessels to constrict. They promote fever and pain. They make our blood platelets sticky. Another group of enzymes, the cyclooxygenases, can convert arachidonic acid into leukotrienes, which are, are nasty. Uh, cytokines, they cause fever, pain, and inflammation. Vioxx and Celebrex work at this step. They're very, very good for your pain because they block leukotrienes. Now, they block the formation of other good chemicals, which is why they cause heart disease. Aspirin works at this level, blocking the conversion of any of these fatty acids into the prostaglandins. So aspirin will get rid of your pain by blocking prostaglandins of the 2 series, but because they block the good prostaglandins from being formed, that's why they cause the bleeding peptic ulcers and the kidney trouble. Mother Nature meant for us to have a balanced diet. We're supposed to eat fish. We're supposed to get in vegetable oils. A little bit of meat and dairy is OK to provide a balance. We don't want our blood platelets to stick abnormally, but we do want to be able to clot wounds. We want our blood vessels to dilate, but not too much. So if our diet is balanced, we have a balanced prostaglandin physiology, and we enjoy good health. But that's not the case. Well, you know, in 1800, it was the case when our total 
fat intake was 20% of calories. Saturated fats and unsaturated fats both made up 10%. But the situation's changed. Now we're taking in 40% of our calories from fat, more and more saturated, and now we have these new man-made trans fats. The unsaturated fatty acid, it used to be equivalent omega-6 and omega-3. We've moved away from the waterways, and we're not eating as much fish. So our omega-3 ratio to omega-6 is now very, very low. Our fatty acid intake has changed way too much from our hunter-gatherer ancestors. We're out of balance. We are not taking in enough vegetable oils, and we poison ourselves with trans fats, not enough B6, sugar and alcohol, saturated fat, diabetes. We don't make gamma-linolenic acid. We don't make prostaglandins of the 1 series. We don't take in flax. We don't take in fish oil. We don't have prostaglandins of the 3 series. We sure take in our meat and dairy. We're making lots of prostaglandins of the 2 series and leukotrienes. Our blood vessels are constricting. We have high blood pressure. We can't handle our cholesterol. Our blood platelets are sticky. We can't maintain our weight because we're out of balance. The solution, take in good essential fatty acids, um, flax, fish, vegetable oils, um, appropriate vitamins and minerals, deal with your diabetes, cut back on meat and dairy, get back into the proper balance. Our blood vessels dilate, we lose weight, our cholesterol falls, our platelets are not sticky, we will get our health back. And can I back it up? Absolutely I can. Low adipose tissue linoleic acid or low blood platelet eicosapentaenoic acid, that's the fish oil essential fatty acid, increased coronary risk. The lowest quintile has three times the risk of the highest quintile. Low adipose tissue gamma-linoleic acid is important as high cholesterol and smoking in predicting new coronary disease. It's a study where they took um, overweight individuals with high cholesterol, put them on a high dose of gamma-linoleic acid, and they lost 9 to 23 pounds over eight weeks without conscious dieting because their metabolism was working correctly. You give Mother Nature what she needs, and their cholesterol fell too. I've been giving this talk for 10 years. I've been saying the same things over and over again. Early on, people didn't listen, or they giggled, and they said, oh, that Roberts, he thinks his patients will swim away from the hospital. Well, you know, no one's laughing at me now. Every single medical group is joined up and is recommending essential fatty acid supplementation. I'm glad that they've caught up. Um, but this is one of my original slides from 1995. And this is what we knew back then. We, we, this, this fish oil story first came out when doctors Bang and Dyerberg, they were epidemiologists, published a paper looking at differences in cardiovascular um, death rate between the Eskimos of Iceland and the Danes. And the Eskimos of Iceland have a very high fat diet. They eat uh, uh, seal oil and whale blubber, whereas the Danes have a moderate fat diet, and, and the Eskimos have much less cardiovascular disease. And this was a surprise because this was at a time when we were saying fat was bad. And genetically, they're very similar because the Eskimos of Iceland are the descendants of shipwrecked Danish sailors just a thousand years earlier, and the gene pool hadn't changed. But something about the high marine oil diet of the Eskimos was protective. It was also shown that Japanese fishermen rarely get heart attacks. Japanese farmers do. The cardiovascular death rate in Norway plummeted during World War II. That's a surprise. War is a stressful thing. That should increase your heart disease. But what happened, all the young men joined the army. The ranching industry kind of ground to a halt. None of the young men were around to, to tend the cattle. Um, all the animals were slaughtered. The meat was processed, sent to the boys at the front. The local population has no meat to eat. Well, it's a maritime country, so they went out in their fishing boats, ate a lot of fish. They had very little heart disease during the war years. When the war is over, they stop eating fish, start eating meat, heart disease rises. So there's something good in fish. What is it? Well, it was found that two key components are the um, essential fatty acids in fish oil. EPA, which is eicosapentaenoic acid, and DHA, which is doc docosex, you know, hell, you know, 
I can't pronounce that. I couldn't pronounce it in 1995. I can't pronounce it now. EPA and DHA. And what we said was they dilate our blood vessels. They keep our platelets from aggregating. They'll decrease your triglycerides. Back then, we said they may increase HDL and decrease leprotein. That's a definite now. May decrease arrhythmia. That's a definite now. Decrease coronary risks and benefits, many other health benefits. Um, some of the early studies, fish oil intake leads to a major decrease in triglycerides. Back then, we said probably lipoprotein A. Decrease in restenosis following balloon angioplasty. Decrease in angina. One study of patients taking 1,800 to 3,600 milligrams a day of EPA DHA, which would be about um, 8,000 milligrams of fish oil, they decreased their, nit their nitroglycerin requirement over two years from 30 to 5 tabs a week. That's pretty darn good. The DART study, Diet and Reinfarction Trial, was published about 15 years ago in Lancet, the most widely read medical journal in the world, and promptly ignored. They took a large group of British men who had survived a heart attack and they were divided into three groups. One group stayed on their usual diet. One group was asked to go on a high fiber diet. The third group went on a high fish diet. They were asked to have two meals a week of an oily ocean fish, like cod or mackerel or herring. Or if they didn't like fish, to take 500 milligrams of EPA a day. Now the high fiber diet had no benefit. The high fish diet, there was a 29% reduction in mortality and the benefit began at 50 days. And that's pretty good to decrease your post-heart attack mortality by 29% just from eating fish. A study from the Netherlands, effect of a fish-rich diet on 20-year cardiovascular status in previously healthy men. Men that took in 30 grams of fish a day, which is maybe two meals a week, had a 50% reduction in coronary event rate over 20 years. What type of fish are helpful here? Oily ocean fish. It's the plankton that make the essential fatty acids. They're eaten by little fish, eaten by bigger fish. The bigger the fish, the more it will concentrate up the food chain. So mackerel, sardine, lake trout, herring are rich in the good stuff. Unfortunately, folks, lobster, swordfish, shrimp, the stuff we like, it's not as good for us. I'm sorry about that, but it's the oily ocean fish. So how do they work? How do essential fatty acids help us? Well, maybe they'll have a beneficial effect on our lipids and lipoprotein A. Here we're going to take 35 male patients with symptomatic coronary disease. We're going to get them on an exercise program. They're going to swim six days a week, put them on a low-calorie, 30% fat diet, and then we're going to give them a supplemental oil, 12 grams a day, randomized as fish oil and omega-3 or rapeseed oil, a processed oil. Recheck lipids in four weeks, double-blind protocol followed, so there's no bias. Body weight fell by 4% in both groups. The LDL fell a little bit more in the rapeseed oil, 20% versus 16% in fish oil. Fish oil did a much better effect with triglycerides, 20% versus 5%, and the HDL rose by 8 points with fish oil by only 1 point with rapeseed oil. Rapeseed oil didn't affect the lipoprotein A, but it fell by 14%. So that's pretty good. Some of the people responded better to fish oil than others. If you, just, if you look at the responders, they had a much more impressive drop. Their HDL rose by 11%. Their lipoprotein A fell by 24%. Why did some patients respond better to fish oil than others? Because some of these people were deficient in essential fatty acids they're going to get the benefit. If you go into a study like this and you've got plenty of fish oil in your diet, giving you more won't help. But because the average American is low in essential fatty acids, you can see a net improvement. The rapeseed oil was a little bit better than fish oil lowering LDL. Fish oil was more effective in lowering triglycerides. Fish oil alone lowered LPA and increased HDL. We'll talk about LPA next week. It's the ugly cholesterol. Effective fish oil on LDL size and ease of oxidation. 20 subjects with hypertension. We're going to look at their lipid panel, their standard lipid levels. We'll look at LDL size. It is desirable if your LDL are large. You don't want small, dense LDL. They looked at the ease at which you can oxidize LDL, and that's a bad thing. You don't want to be able to oxidize your LDL. Randomize them to a six-week regimen of 
for fish oil gel caps, so they got 3,400 milligrams of EPA GHA or corn oil, and then you reevaluate. Now, um, neither the corn oil or the fish oil had much effect on, on uh, cholesterol. Triglycerides fell with fish oil, not much effect on HDL, and the LDL increased in the fish oil. That would be bad, wouldn't it? You don't want a high LDL. But the LDLs were, were larger. The reason the measured LDL rose was because the LDL are now larger. Larger LDL are not as atherogenic as small LDL. So we're looking at the size of the LDL. So the point is that the fish oil has a beneficial effect not on the LDL number, but the quality of the LDL. The one downside was lag time to oxidation. It was easier to oxidize the LDL in the fish oil group. Remember what I said, fish oils can be oxidized by free radicals. So when you take a fish oil, you got to take antioxidants. And that's a key point. Otherwise, you might increase your oxidative burden. That's really the only downside, fish oil. Uh, let's talk about um, uh, platelet aggregation and platelet monocyte aggregation. PMA, PMA, the percentage of your platelets and monocytes that will aggregate when put together, it's a sensitive marker of platelet activation and monocyte activation and adherence to the endothelium. Remember in the skit last week I talked about how the white cells enter the endothelium and that's a bad idea? You don't want to see that. 46 healthy men measure their percent platelet monocyte aggregation on their usual diet or on a fish diet. They had them eat 500 grams of smoked mackerel a week over four weeks. Not a whole lot. Then they go back to their usual diet. If we look at their essential fatty acid intake per day, it, you know, it rises tenfold when they're eating the mackerel, and their platelet monocyte aggregation fell. And that's a good sign. Effect of fish on homocysteine. Um, homocysteine's a bad actor. It promotes clotting and plaque deposition, restenosis after balloon angioplasty. As your homocysteine rises, your cardiac risk rises, and you're at greater risk for Alzheimer's disease, miscarriage, rheumatoid arthritis, you don't want a high homocysteine. Here we're going to take 17 men with hyperlipidemia, all on a balanced diet, give them fish oil 12 grams a day or olive oil 12 grams a day, then cross them over. You measure the homocysteine levels. The levels fell in response to fish oil in 14 of the 17 uh, men, 48% below baseline in the fish oil first group, 36% in the olive oil, then switched to fish oil. The message is fish oil has a beneficial effect on homocysteine. Fish oil and platelet function. This is a little complicated, but I think you're going to all understand this one will make sense. Platelet activation, aggregation adhesion, initiates the clotting process. It damages the endothelium, compromising endothelial function, taking away the Teflon lining. If this promotes the development of atherosclerosis, and it precipitates the consequences, the unstable angina, the heart attack. How is this all working? In the platelets, there's an enzyme called cyclooxygenase that will convert arachidonic acid from meat and dairy into thromboxane A2, which is really bad. It wants to make the platelet sticky. This same enzyme, cyclooxygenase, will convert eicosopentaenoic acid, which you get from fish oil, into thromboxane A3, which is inert. There's only so much cyclooxygenase in the platelet. The relative percentage of the bad thromboxane A2 and the inert thromboxane A3 is solely related to the percentage of the fats in your diet that are the, the good one or the bad one. That's the determining feature. In the endothelial cells that want to keep the platelets from sticking to them, cyclooxygenase will convert arachidonic acid into prostacyclin I2, which is inert to favorable. But fish oils, the enzyme will convert it to prostacyclin I3, which is very good. Again, whether you have good or bad prosta prostacyclins is a function solely of your diet. So here, we'll look at platelet stickiness with increasing and decreasing doses of cod liver oil. First of all, you can see the good prostacyclin rises. As you increase fish oil, the bad thromboxane in the platelets falls. Here we're going to look at the rate of platelet aggregation in response to collagen. 
Collagen is a structural protein that the blood's not supposed to see. But if there's a crack in our artery, a ruptured plaque, the platelets can see it and it causes them to clot. And that's deleterious. We don't want to see that. As you're taking in a lot more fish oil, you can see the platelets are no longer clotting as readily. So your platelet function, as far as Mother Nature is concerned, is related to your diet. Aspirin blocks the bad stuff, but it also blocks the good stuff. Mother Nature will give you the good stuff and not the bad stuff and not drug consequences. Fibrinogen is an inactive precursor molecule that can be converted at the site of blood vessel injury to fibrin. That's the stuff that causes a scab, fi a fibrin mesh. Now, whenever our body forms a clot in an artery, it wants to seal the, the, the rent, but it doesn't want to close off the artery. So the minute we start to form a clot, we also start to dissolve it, to trim it down. We don't want it to occlude the flow area and cause a heart attack or a stroke. Plasminogen is an inactive molecule that will be converted by tissue plasminogen activator to plasmin. Plasmin's a clot dissolver. If we have plasminogen and its activator, but also present is its inhibitor, plasminogen activator inhibitor called Pi-1, we can't make plasmin, the blood clot grows. Fibrinogen, the immediate precursor to fibrin in blood clots, is, is a bad guy. Fibrinogen levels correlate with the risk of an adverse event. Smoking and inflammation raise the fibrinogen level. Most of my patients have a high fibrinogen level. It makes the blood viscous, but they're more likely to clot. Now this Pi-1 binds up the TPA and blocks clot dissolution. Pi-1 levels rise with age, triglycerides, diabetes, the presence of coronary disease. Fibrinogen and Pi-1 produce cardiovascular events. They're bad guys. Will fish oil supplementation affect their levels? Here we're going to take 65, 35 to 40 year old men, no known heart disease, their average fibrinogen level is 273, which is pretty good. Most of the patients are 400 to 500. You're going to give them fish oil, 14 grams a day, or olive oil as a placebo, and then you're going to look at the fibrinogen levels. And the olive oil group, it had no effect but there was a 13% reduction in the fish oil group. And in patients who started with higher levels, you would have seen a greater reduction. So fish oil is lower fibrinogen. Um, eight men with stable angina, four healthy controls, same usual diet of medications. You're going to treat them for four weeks with 18 placebo capsules or 18 max EPA capsules, giving them about 5,000 milligrams of EPA DHA. And you're going to look at triglyceride and PI-1 levels. Now, in the healthy, normal people, in response to fish oil supplementation, triglycerides fell by 13%. In the patients, they started with a higher level, you get a greater response, falling from 260 to 123. Pi-1, which wants to cause abnormal clotting, fell by 21% in the healthy controls from 22 to 17. The patients started out with higher Pi-1 levels, and they also fell. So in patients, you know, the, the fish oil supplementation will lower your triglycerides, lower your fibrinogen, lower your PI-1. But what's interesting are the healthy controls that are supposed to be healthy got a lot more healthy with fish oil supplementation. And again, healthy Americans are just people waiting to be diagnosed with heart disease or cancer. Because that's where we're, gonna, we're either going to die from heart disease or cancer. We have a bad diet. We have a polluted environment. Our biochemistry is messed up. So whenever I show healthy controls and they take nutritional supplements and I see they get better health, it just you know, reminds me that I should get everybody on this bandwagon. Don't wait to get sick. Fish oil and coagulation, platelet activation, the platelet monocyte aggregation is blunted, fibrinogen falls, the PI-1 falls, homocysteine falls, LPA falls, beneficial effect on coagulation. Um, endothelial function, the ability of the cells lining our blood vessels to make nitric oxide. That is the most important determinant of outcome. We're going to spend two sessions on this subject. Anything that improves endothelial function is protective. Anything that compromises endothelial function is deleterious. If your endothelium is shot, you're going to die of cardiovascular disease. So we want to fix this. We're going to take 30 patients with high cholesterol, measure the ability of the brachial artery to dilate in response to a physiologic stimulus. You're going to randomize them to placebo or 
ethyl ester EPA, um, so they're getting about uh, 1,700 milligrams of EPA DHA. And at four months, you reevaluate. Normal endothelial vasodilatation should be about 15%. The placebo patients didn't get any better. The fish oil patients rose from 5% to 12%. They almost normalized. So fish oil rescued the endothelium from high cholesterol. Now, we've been talking about fish oil supplementation and effects on PI-1 and fibrinogen and platelet clotting, all this stuff going on in the blood. If we take fish oils, will they get into the heart? Will they actually get into our organs? Here, we're going to look at 17 patients scheduled for open heart surgery. Six weeks prior to the surgery, randomize them to get 4,400 milligrams of EPA and DHA or olive oil and then measure plasma and heart muscle essential fatty acid levels at the time of surgery. Well, with supplementation, your plasma, EPA, and DHA levels rise. They don't rise with olive oil. Well, that makes sense. You take it out of getting your blood. Then they biopsied the heart, and they looked at the percentage of the fatty acids that were um, EPA or DHA, so you can see they're getting into the heart. So if you take fish oils, they're entering the blood, and they're entering the heart muscle. But people don't want to believe me when I talk about that. Again, they want me to talk about drugs and surgery. They aren't really excited about taking fish oils. They don't really believe the fish oils are getting the heart muscle. So to prove it to the medical community, what I did with a bunch of my patients, I did endomyocardial biopsies in the office. You're not really supposed to do that in the office, but I'm really good at it, and I'm not going to hurt anybody. I, I did that when I trained. We would put a little catheter into your jugular vein. It has like a little fingernail clipper on the tip of it, and we'd bump up against the wall of the heart and grab a little chunk of heart and pull back, and the patient would feel a little jerk, you know, as we're ripping this chunk of heart muscle out. But, but we, never, we hardly ever hurt anybody. So, um, so I took my patients, and I put them on fish oils, and I did an endomyocardial biopsy, and here I'll show you what it looks like under the light microscope. And people might say there's something fishy going on in the heart. <laughs> what this actually is is a scar from a heart attack that they cut, and it just had this little fishy thing, and it made it into New England Journal of Medicine. Um, fish oil and angina. 39 coronary patients with effort-related angina, abnormal stress tests, do a baseline evaluation, randomize them to placebo or um, 4,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA, reevaluate eight to 12 weeks, double blind protocol, there's no bias. Angina frequency didn't change with placebo therapy, it actually rose by 12%. Angina frequency fell by 31% from 12.2 to 8.4 episodes with fish oil. Nitroglycerin requirement fell by 46%. Time how far you could walk on the treadmill is very, very important. If you can walk farther on the stress test before you have pain or ST segment depression, that is, is a plus. We'll be talking about that more in our ECP lecture. There was no change with placebo therapy, but the patients could walk nearly two minutes longer. Treadmill time or treadmill time before you became abnormal ischemic was prolonged by 23% from 8.2 to 10.1. That's phenomenal. An extra minute on the treadmill is great. And if a drug does that, that's super. ECP will do that. Um, Coenzyme Q will do that. Carnitine will do that. We'll talk about them later. Fish oils give you two minutes. Another study, 107 subjects followed for two years. 93 had heart disease or hypertension. 31 had angina. You give them um, 4,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA, and you, you watch their lipids and angina frequency. Triglycerides fall from 237 to 140. Cholesterol falls a smidge. HDL rises from 46 to 53. Nitroglycerin requirement falls to the floor. They got better. Disease progression and event rates. I was taught that the percent narrowing of the artery was the most important determinant of outcome. So our strategies were designed to open up arteries. We're going to do a balloon angioplasty and open up the artery. We, we were anatomists. Well, making decisions based on anatomy has given way to making decisions based on physiology. Flow rates, endothelial function, platelet stickiness are much more important determinants of outcome. But 10 years ago, if I gave a patient fish oil and they did well, 
but the artery didn't open up, I would be criticized and the other guys would say, well, you didn't do anything because you didn't open up the artery. Well, we, we now know that opening up an artery isn't necessary or critical. Fixing your physiology, of course, is. But to placate the traditionalist, we can look and see what effect fish oils will have on the percent narrowing. 223 patients with abnormal angiograms, you put them on an oil supplement for two years, randomized as a 55% EPA DHA mix or the fatty acid mix common in Europe. The study was done in Europe. So kind of a normal fatty acid content, a European fatty acid content, or a high fish oil. You do an angiogram at baseline, again, and at two years. Does fish oil have any effect on the rate at which the arteries will narrow? Plus one, plus two, plus three. And this is a little confusing, but there was more disease progression in the placebo than in the fish oil. More arteries opened up a little bit in fish oil than placebo. Over the two-year period, in the placebo patients, the arteries narrowed further by 0.45 millimeters. They narrowed further with fish oil, but less, 0.38 millimeters. So that it shows the rate at which your arteries are going to obstruct is blunted or retarded with fish oil. But again, anatomy is not key. That's a modest effect on anatomy, but what happened to the patient outcome, which is what you're more interested in, there were seven events with placebo, only two with fish oil. Three heart attacks versus one, three strokes versus one, and that was from high blood pressure. The only <coughs> death was in placebo. So if we can make your anatomy look better, that's fine. But if we make your physiology function better, we're going to protect you from events, which is really what we're, why we practice medicine. Omega-3s can prevent sudden death. Here we're going to take 415 fins, presenting for an acornea event or revascularization, you know, a quarter had a bypass, a quarter had a heart attack, angioplasty, unstable angina. At baseline, you're going to measure the fatty acid composition of our cholesterol esters. We'll talk about cholesterol esters when we talk about phosphatidylcholine. But you're looking at the, the fatty acid composition of the blood. You follow them for five years, and over that five-year period, 36 died, 21 from cardiovascular disease. Let's correlate five-year death risk as a function of your baseline fatty acid panel. And it was shown that individuals in the upper quartile for alpha linoleic acid, that's flax oil, or EPA and DHA, they um, were only a third as likely to die suddenly. So there's a 70 to 75 percent risk reduction in people with cardiovascular disease who are taking in a lot of good essential fatty acids. So that would suggest fish oils have an effect on arrhythmia. You know, Nerves are lipid, they're made of fat. If somebody calls you a fat head, you should say thank you, because the brain's full of fat and cholesterol, right? Um, but nerves are made of fat. Arrhythmias are due to disturbance in electrical conduction of the cardiac nerves. So it would make sense that if you have good fats, your nerves will work better, and if you have bad fats, the nerves won't conduct as well. So would, will fish oils be protective? Here, they took a study of 24 patients with life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. They were all very, very sick. They wanted to have like 60 patients in the study, but many died while they were waiting to get involved. This was a really sick group. And you randomize them to just over 4 grams a day of EPA and DHA versus corn oil placebo, and you do 24-hour EKGs at baseline and at four, 16 weeks. Let's look at the percentage of fatty acids in the white cells. In the controls, um, nothing really changes. The percent of EPA doesn't rise because they're getting a corn oil placebo. In the patients that got the, the fish oil, the percentage of EPA rose dramatically from 0.7 to 2.7, and the arachidonic acid percentage fell. You can kind of drown out the arachidonic acid, the bad guy, if you supplement with the good guy. Let's look at the number of extra heartbeats for 24 hours. Spontaneously, in the corn oil group, there was a 43% reduction, in the fish oil group, there was a 95% reduction from 360 to 18. Now, the difference here was not statistically significant, so the conclusion was fish oils are not helpful. But, you know, you and I can think, and we can see, hmm, 95% reduction, that's probably a pretty good idea. And if it was a larger study, they would have shown statistically that fish oils are, are preventative. And here, we can, we, can, we can really prove the point. 
we're going to take 10 patients at high risk for sudden death. They had abnormal hearts, recurrent ventricular tachycardia. This is the arrhythmia that kills you, that causes sudden death. These people were so sick that they all had automatic defibrillators in place because their doctors knew they were at high risk. And they took them off the drugs and they did an electrophysiology test. Now what you do here, you put a catheter into the right side of the heart and you spark the heart, you stimulate it. And if you stimulate it just right, you can bring on a tachycardia. And we can say your tachycardia is inducible. <coughs> if we cannot bring on the tachycardia with a catheter, you're not inducible. If you're inducible, you're at much greater risk of keeling over dead than if you're not inducible. So if you're not inducible, that's a very, very good sign. So they took these, these patients, all who had had tachyarrhythmias, and they did the e test, and they could induce the tachycardia in 7 out of the 10. Then they gave them 3,800 milligrams of fish oil IV, which you can do, and only two were inducible. So administering fish oils will protect you from the most serious cardiac arrhythmias. Atrial fibrillation is a non-life-threatening arrhythmia. It's when the upper chamber, instead of beating rhythmically, beats like a sack of worms. Your cardiac output falls by 20 to 40 percent, and we have to put you on blood thinners to prevent clot forming. It's, it's a big nuisance. It can be life-threatening, and it's real, real, real common. Forty percent of people that undergo open heart have temporary atrial fibrillation out afterwards. The, your, the frequency with which we see atrial fibrillation rises with age. We see it in a lot of seniors. Um, so let's see if fish intake has any effect on your risk of atrial fib. We're going to take 4,815 seniors participating in the cardiovascular health study. In 1990, we're going to get an idea of their dietary intake of fish, divided into two categories, tuna, broiled, or baked fish. This is typically um, ocean fish rich in the EPA and DHA, and they looked at fried fish and fish sandwiches. This is typically freshwater fish, and there's a lot of breading, and it's fried in trans fats. So this stuff isn't going to be as good for you. Correlate fish intake with the percentage of EPA and DHA in plasma phospholipids, and we're going to look for new onset atrial fib over the next 12 years. And basically, um, a fourth of the patients developed atrial fib over 12 years. Atrial fib is very common in seniors. Now, the, the fried fish or the fish sandwich was not very protective. Here you have less than one fish sandwich a month. Here you have one a week. It doesn't increase the percentage of EPA and DHA in your plasma. But the more tuna and other fish that you took in, the greater will be the percentage of the EPA and DHA in your plasma and your red cells, and that's a good thing. So the more of the good fish you take in, the better the mixture of fatty acids in your body, but not the fried fish or the fish sandwiches. Now, what about the relative risk um, with taking in a lot of fish sandwiches or taking a lot of tuna? Um, the more fish sandwiches and fried fish you took in, the greater was your risk. As opposed to those that had less than one fried fish sandwich a month, those that had one to three per month were 12% more likely to develop atrial fib. Those that were having one to four a week were 27% more likely. Conversely, the more tuna and other ocean fish meals you took in, you know, habitually, the greater was your protection. Here we can look at um, survival without atrial fib. The more tuna and, and baked fish you took in, the more the protection. The more um, fried fish you took in, the greater is your risk. Because the fried fish have a lot of trans fats, not a lot of good stuff. The tuna and the baked fish have the EPA and DHA protecting you from atrial fib. Um, what if you got atrial fib and we're trying to treat you? Here we got 25 patients with recurrent intermittent atrial fib, none with valvular heart disease, all had at least four episodes per year despite drug therapy from cardiologists. So these people were drug treatment failures. So you're going to supplement them with 1,000 milligrams a day of EPA DHA for six months. Over that six-month period, two of the 25 had one episode, shorter in duration than pretreatment. 23 did not have atrial fib. So when drugs did not work, fish oils produced a 90% resolution rate of 
intermittent or paroxysmal atrial fib. Wow. Um, Post-bypass surgery atrial fib is a big problem. It occurs in about 40% of patients. And you can prevent it with magnesium, but we don't use that. We like to use these expensive drugs. But what if we would supplement you with fish oil? If we take 150 subjects who are going to undergo bypass, and you randomize them to receive placebo or 2,000 milligrams of EP and DHA seven days pre-op through hospital discharge. The risk of atrial fib complicating surgeries, 36% with placebo, 15% with fish oil. The fish oil patients got out of the hospital a day earlier. So if everybody undergoing open heart surgery was put on fish oil, we'd have less arrhythmia and we'd get people out of the hospital a day sooner. So you'd think the hospitals would go for it because they get people out sooner, they make more money, but that's not going to happen in the United States because we're not going to use nutritional supplements. We're going to use drugs instead. Um, autonomic tone, the balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, you want balance. You don't want to have sympathetic dominance. That raises your heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and you can measure this, and it's, and it's an important predictor. We take 18 men with coronary disease and poor pump function, their ejection fraction, the percentage of blood ejected by the heart with each beat, it should be 55%. They had pump impairment, they're only 40%. Randomize them to receive over four months placebo or 1,000 milligrams of EP and DHA, and you do stress studies, and you see that the resting heart rate is lower in the fish oil group. Their sympathetic nervous system had been toned down. And their heart rates will fall more readily following a stress test. And this is a marker of autonomic function, and it's favorable. The stroke volume, the, the amount of blood the heart squeezes out with each beat, was also better. So there's a beneficial effect here on this part of the nervous system. Um, how much fish oil do you need? The American Heart Association recommends 1,000 milligrams a day of EP and DHA if you have known heart disease. For prevention, two fish meals a week. Um, or 500 milligrams of EPA or DHA. Now really what we want is a high percentage of the fatty acids in our cell membrane to be made up of EPA and DHA. And above 8% is great, below 4% you're at high risk. So here we're going to take 46 healthy subjects, measure their baseline red cell EF, uh, EPA DHA percent, put them on 500 uh, or 1,000 milligrams of EPA and DHA or placebo, reevaluate at five months, and you see that in those that took 1,000 milligrams, the representation of EP and DHA in the cell membrane was a really nice 10%. If they took in 500 milligrams, it was 8%. If they were not treated, they're all pretty much in the danger zone because remember, healthy Americans are those that just haven't yet found their heart disease or cancer. If you took um, 1,000 milligrams a day, 80% of you were up in the safety zone. If you took placebo, only 10% of you are in the safety zone, 55% are in the danger zone. Um, what if you have a heart attack? Will fish oil supplementation help you? Here we have the Indian experiment of infarct survival. 360 heart attack patients all receive standard medical therapy. In the ER, they're randomized to fish oil, 2,000 milligrams a day of EPA DHA, Mustard oil, which is alpha linolenic acid, which is like flaxseed oil, basically. Three grams a day or placebo. Treatments are initiated within 18 hours. They all receive the same standard therapy. Double-blind protocol. You're going to evaluate them at 10 days, 28 days, and at a year. At 10 days, there were six deaths in the controls, six deaths in the mustard seed oil, four in the fish oil. That was not statistically significant. But non-fatal recurrent heart attack at 10 days there was only one in the fish oil group versus six in the placebos and the mustard oil group. At 28 days, um, major events, 29% in the placebo controls, 19% in the omega-3 ALA, 16% in the omega-3 fish oil. So a major reduction in major events at, at four weeks. What about over a year? Recurrent angina after a heart attack is a bad sign. It means you're at risk for another heart attack. That occurred in 42% on controls and in about 20% of those with omega-3 supplementation. Congestive heart failure falls from 19% to about 9%. Low ejection fraction, poor pump function, falls from 47% to about 24%. Cardiac arrhythmia falls from 29 to 18%. Sudden death, 
7%, 2%, non-fatal recurrent heart attack, 25% to about 17%. Cardiovascular death, you know, if you take fish oil, you're only half as likely to die at a year. The death rate's 11% versus 22% with um, the placebo diet. Total events at a year, 35% with placebo, 28% with the alpha linoleic acid, 24% with fish oil. So there's a, you know, 10 of 100 people, 10 out of 100 people who are supposed to die or have a major event didn't. And that ratio is what we've seen with antioxidants and what we'll show you with coenzyme Q and carnitine in a later lecture. And my patients take all this stuff and I think the benefits are additive. Um, another more modern day study of fish oil and late post myocardial infarction outcome, we're going to get 11,000 Europeans. Now they're three months out from their heart attack and they've survived. Now they're all on modern day European drug therapy, 91% on platelet therapies like aspirin or Plavix, 44% on beta blockers, 47% on ACE inhibitors, randomized them to vitamin E, fish oil, 1,000 milligrams a day, E and fish oil are a control group, and you'll follow them three and a half years. Vitamin E had a weak beneficial effect that we've talked about before. Here I'm just going to talk about fish oil. Fish oil had very minimal effect on cholesterol, LDL. The HDLs were a little bit higher, and the triglycerides were a lot lower. But that's really not how fish oils are working. It's not, they do change your lipid panel, but that's not how they're working. They're fixing the prostaglandin imbalance. Total mortality, there was a significant benefit at three months. 1.1% versus 1.6%. At the end of the study, at 42 months, mortality was 8.4% with fish oil, 9.8% with placebo. Sudden death, statistically significant protection, occurred at four months. Coronary mortality, 1.3 versus 1.8% at eight months, 3.7 versus 4.6 at 42 months, overall cardiovascular mortality. So adding in fish oil to modern day prim and proper drug therapy has a beneficial effect as you would expect it to. Fish oil and restenosis, if you have a balloon angioplasty, the problem is the Achilles heel is re-narrowing. And we talked about how antioxidants can blunt restenosis. And next week we'll talk about how vitamin C blunts restenosis. Here, we're going to take patients and randomize them to olive oil or a high dose of max EPA, um, uh, four grams a day. And the key was they began it three weeks before the angioplasty and continued it for six months. It takes fatty materials a while to get into the cells. If you just do the angioplasty and put them on fish oil, it's not going to do anything. But by giving it for three weeks, you get a chance to get it into the cell membrane. Um, olive oil had no effect on triglycerides. They f it fell with fish oils. They did a nuclear stress study at three months. It was definitely normal in 59% of the fish oil versus 36% of the olive oil. Definitely abnormal, 23% of the olive oil, 11% of the fish oil. They repeated the heart cath at six months, and they found that restenosis had recurred, re-narrowing in 40% of olive oil, 22% of fish oil. So you need fewer angioplasties. Other studies have not reproduced this, so there's some controversy. So the politically correct experts say fish oil is of no value here, but you know, we got a bunch of studies showing that it is. Um, well, if you do have an angioplasty, you don't take the fish oil, you re-narrow, that's no problem. We can do open heart surgery. But then we got to keep those grafts open because if they close off, you're back to where you started. Um, 610 patients undergoing bypass, you put them on a standard low-fat diet, and for the purpose of the study, you say, don't take in any fish oils on your own. You randomize them to 3,300 milligrams of EPA and DHA versus no oil, or aspirin versus Coumadin. So a quarter of the patients took aspirin alone, a quarter Coumadin alone, a quarter fish oil and aspirin, a quarter fish oil and Coumadin. You evaluate them periodically, look for abnormal bleeding, repeat the cath at one year. First of all, there was no abnormal bleeding related to fish oils. People will tell you, oh, don't take those fish oils, they'll make you bleed. If you take aspirin or Coumadin, you can't take fish oils, you're going to bleed. That is not a correct statement. The science tells us that fish oils do not cause abnormal bleeding. 
the individuals who took Coumadin and fish oil didn't bleed any more than people who took Coumadin. So fish oils don't cause pathological bleeding. Anyone who tells you that is not being scientifically accurate. What about the effect on graft occlusion rate? Now in the aspirin alone group, 34% of the grafts closed by one year. 49% of the patients lost at least one graft. But aspirin with fish oil, only 29% of the grafts closed. Fewer patients lost a graft. Coumadin, a more vigorous blood thinner, was not any better than aspirin, but Coumadin and fish oil did better than Coumadin alone. The relative risk of losing a graft at one year fell by 23% if you were taking fish oil. Your, the, the risk for the individual patient to have lost at least one graft fell by 28%. The benefit, the, the relative benefit of the fish oil supplementation had to do with the magnitude of the change in your essential fatty acid levels. Those with low fish oil levels that you bring them up a lot, they were the ones that had the most protection, which makes sense. If you got plenty of fish oils in your diet, giving you more won't do much. But if you're low, we improve your physiology, you can hold on to your grafts longer, certainly a good thing. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about diabetic neuropathy. You know, when I give you a drug to treat your heart, I'll probably help your heart, and I may have adverse effects on other organ systems that can be lethal, right? We're all concerned about drug side effects. But with nutritional medicine, any nutritional supplement that's good for your heart is probably going to be good for every organ in your body. Because if your heart was low in fish oil, probably every organ in your body is low in fish oil. So the neat thing about nutritional medicine is we don't have side effects, we have additional benefits. So let's look at fish oils on some other organ systems. Diabetic neuropathy is very important to me. Our MME, our Magnetic Molecular Energizer Program, we're doing a randomized double-blind study of MME versus sham MME in diabetic neuropathy. So I've been studying diabetic neuropathy rather intently. And it's a problem when the diabetes damages the peripheral nerves and you have pain, burning, and numbness in your toes and then in your hands, and it works its way up. And it's a pretty miserable situation, and there's no good drug therapies for it. Now, prostaglandins manufactured from GLA, the omega-6, are important in nerve membrane structure, nerve blood flow, and nerve conduction. The conversion of linoleic acid into GLA is defective in diabetics, so they're going to be low in the series 1 prostaglandins. Peripheral neuropathy is a common complication in diabetes. In diabetic animals, if you supplement with GLA, this will restore abnormally reduced nerve blood flow, increasing prostacyclin, which interacts with nitric oxide to dilate. It corrects the nerve conduction defect. In diabetic humans, conversion of dietary fatty acids into the essential fatty acid precursors of the beneficial series 1 and 3 prostaglandins is impaired. Cell membrane omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acid levels are low. Arachidonic levels are high. So, with supplementation with gamolinic acid, rectify the situation, improve symptoms and nerve function in diabetics with neuropathy. Three studies have been done, randomized double-line formats of 480 milligrams of gamolinic acid in diabetic neuropathy, and it was a slam dunk. They all got better across the board. One of the reasons you have diabetic neuropathy is because of a prostaglandin imbalance. You don't have any GLA. We give it back to you, you get better. Lipoic acid and B vitamins are also helpful in diabetic neuropathy. Fish oils. Proven benefit in cardiovascular disease. Now, fish oils can be oxidized. They can increase the blood sugar in diabetics, but not if you take an antioxidants. But if you're a diabetic and you just take fish oil, your blood sugar can go up. But if you're taking antioxidants, that should not happen. Essential fatty acids are involved in nerve function. Um, you know, they help with cardiac arrhythmias and autonomic function. Would they help in diabetic neuropathy? 21 diabetic patients with painful neuropathy, and they had vascular disease. They had no pulses in their feet. They had two problems. This is the type of person that would see me. Poor blood vessels and diabetes. You're going to give them 600 milligrams of, 1,800 milligrams a day of EPA for 48 weeks. And what you find, the EPA percentage rises, their blood sugar rose, and their hemoglobin A1C rose because they didn't give them antioxidants. Um, 
triglycerides fell if they were high, cholesterol fell if it was high, you're an albumin. If you're a diabetic, your doctor's always looking at the amount of protein in your urine. Protein in your urine means the blood vessels of the kidneys have been damaged by free radical stress and an abnormality in your prostaglandins. We've already demonstrated that antioxidants help blunt protein spillage. You can see that the urine albumin falls by 42% with fish oil. That's huge. Why? It repairs the vasculature in the kidneys just like it does everywhere else in the body. Change in vibratory threshold, the ability to discriminate two points with a tuning fork, um, improved um, change in, in blood flow in the dorsalis pedis artery, that's the artery over the, the top of your foot, the, the, blood, the blood vessel dilated and blood flow improved. So nerve function improves, blood flow improves, and their symptoms of coldness and numbness melted away, as you would expect. Essential fatty acids and kidney disease. 106 patients with IgA nephropathy. This is an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks the kidney. They're spilling protein in their urine because the sieve has been, is leaky. Their creatinine is elevated. Creatinine is made in the muscles at a constant level. It's filtered by the kidney. If the kidneys fail, your creatinine blood level goes up. If your kidneys are getting better, your creatinine will fall. 58% were hypertensive, 61% were on ACE inhibitors, which is an appropriate drug, which we'll talk about at another meeting. You're going to treat them for two years with six gel caps twice a day. One group got placebo, one group got um, about 3,500 milligrams of EPA and DHA. You're going to follow them for two years, and your endpoints are a greater than 50% rise in creatinine. So if your creatinine went from 2 to 3, that was an abnormal endpoint, or progression to end-stage renal disease, frank kidney failure requiring transplant or dialysis. Will fish oils help here? Now, 27% of the patients on placebo bump their creatinine by 50%, only 5% on fish oil. End-stage renal disease, there was no protection, 8% and 7%, but death rate, 2% with fish oil, 6% with placebo. The study was unblinded at the two-year point because the fish oil was obviously a value. And at that point, um, it was up to the patient and the physician whether they should continue on fish oil or if they were on the placebo group, should they switch over to fish oil given that it was so helpful. Of the original fish oil group, 45 of the initial 55 were still alive and well. Um, 44 continued fish oil, one was lost to follow. It was a good thing, let's keep you on it. Of the original placebo group, 30 of the initial 51 were still alive and event-free. 17 saw the wisdom of switching over to fish oil. 13 must have had doctors that weren't thinking because they were advised not to go on fish oil. So they were off fish oil, and you're going to follow them now for 6.4 years. Now this is outcome from the 2-year to 6.4-year point. Those that were on fish oil the whole time only 31% bumped their creatinine by 50% over the 6.4 year period. Only 2% you know, went on to, to frank kidney failure. Of those that were on placebo for two years and then switched to fish oil, 35% bumped their creatinine, but because they had, only, they had not been on fish oil the whole time, 24% actually went on to full kidney failure. Those who took placebo for the entire six and a half years, 69% um, increased their creatinine, only 31% were stable, and a greater percentage, 31%, had to go on dialysis. So being on fish oil the whole time was the best approach, but it's never too late to do intelligent things. Those people that switched from placebo to fish oil at two years still had a benefit. The reduction in protein spillage, proteinuria every year, was 7% with placebo, 15% with fish oil, certainly a good thing. This is alive and without a bump in creatinine. Here we have fish oil, here we have placebo. Alive and free of end-stage renal disease, here we have fish oil, here we have placebo. Certainly a good idea, it's protective. But if you don't take the fish oil, because your insurance company won't pay for it, of course, well, that's okay, you can get a kidney transplant and your insurance company will pay for it. But then the problem is holding on to your kidney. Now, 
the, the kidney, you know, your body responds to the kidney transplant like it's a tumor. It's not your normal tissues, and your immune system wants to reject it. So to help you hold on to your kidney, the doctors have to give you immunosuppressive therapy. Prednisone, which um, is a steroid, azathioprine, which is used in chemotherapy, but the best rejection drug, and the one that's really revolutionized kidney transplantation, is cyclosporin. It's a great drug to prevent rejection of the kidney, but it has some downsides. It will gum up your prostaglandin mix. It makes thromboxane A2, leukotrienes, bad guys. This constricts the blood vessels of the kidney, causes high blood pressure, and it's actually toxic to the kidney. So the transplant nephrologist has to watch you very closely and give you just enough cyclosporin to prevent rejection, but not too much to gum up your prostaglandins. It's kind of a tricky thing. So cyclosporin is necessary to prevent transplant rejection, but it's toxic to the kidney. One of the ways it's toxic is gumming up prostaglandins that are made from essential fatty acids. So if we supplement you with essential fatty acids following a transplant, can we blunt cyclosporin toxicity? Will that have a benefit on the function of your new transplanted kidney? 58 patients with initially successful cadaver kidney transplants. So they aren't like from an identical twin, so your immune system is going to try to reject them. you got to be put on cyclosporin and prednisone. On the third day post-op, you begin a one-year treatment program of ethyl ester EPA, so they're getting um, 3,000 milligrams of EPA and GHA, and coconut oil is a placebo. And they wanted to make sure, you know, you, can, you know when you're taking fish oil, and they want to have it blinded so there's no bias. So what they did, they mixed in with the coconut oil fish flavor perfume. Now, you know, I asked my wife to look for fish flavor perfume, but she didn't see it anywhere. But, and you're going to follow them for a year. And here's what you find. You know, you, you begin fish oil versus placebo at three days. At four weeks, the mean blood pressure was higher in the placebos than in the fish oil group. Blood pressure tends to rise as the kidney becomes dysfunctional, or maybe it will reject a little bit. But in the placebo patients, it continues to rise over a year, but it does not rise further in the fish oil group. The percentage requiring blood pressure drug lowering drugs, 85% at four weeks with placebo, 36% on fish oil. And at the end of the year, there's still a protection. 92% of those on placebo are on drugs for blood pressure versus only half of those on fish oil. So it's lowering your blood pressure. Glomerular filtration rate is really the measure of kidney function. In normal, healthy people, it should be 100. Now, their kidneys, you know, they only had one kidney and it was a transplanted kidney. It's not going to be 100, but you want to have the GFR as high as possible. At three months, the GFR was higher in the fish oil group, and over time, it continued to improve, whereas it was worse in the placebo group and it didn't get any better. So not only is the blood pressure lower, you need fewer drugs, your transplanted kidney is functioning better. If we look at how much protein is spilled over 24 hours, one-tenth as much in the fish oil group because the sieve was not so leaky. Episodes of transplant rejection, 20 in the controls, 6 in fish oil. Days in the hospital, 28 versus 21. Second admits per patient, 1.1 versus 0.4. Days per second emit, 11 versus 2. So you're keeping people out of the hospital. Graph survival, 84% with placebo therapy. All right, that means that 16% um, of the patients had to go back on dialysis. They lost their kidney. Graph survival, 97% with fish oil. Only 3% had to go on dialysis. Pretty good outcome, isn't it? When you get a kidney transplant in the United States, do they give you fish oil? No. This was done in Europe, and it's routine in Europe, but we don't do this in the United States because of our bias against nutritional therapy. And your insurance company won't pay for it. But of course, if you need a new kidney transplant, that's OK. You know, we'll, we'll pay for that. Um, effect on white cell tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6. These are inflammatory cytokines. They're bad guys. Now, when you're fighting pneumonia, you want your body to make some free radicals and inflammatory cytokines and then stop making them. 
because we make too much of these inflammatory cytokines, we get into autoimmune and allergic and immunologic disease. Here we're going to take 16 healthy young men, look at the percentage of fatty acids in the red cell membrane that are, that are um, EPA uh, and DHA, and you're going to look at the TNF and interleukin-6 production by white cells at rest and after you stimulate them with a bacterial cell wall product. You're going to do that at baseline and at four-week intervals after supplementation with 300, 1,000, or 3,000 milligrams a day of EP and DHA. Now, as you increase the dose of the fish oil supplement, the percentage of the reds of the fatty acids that are EPA and DHA, of course, will rise. The more fish oils you give, the greater the representation of the cell membranes of the EPA, DHA. Here we're going to look at the white cell interleukin-6 and TNF production at baseline and when stimulated. On the placebo therapy, you're making a lot more of these inflammatory mediators, more than you really need. But with supplementation, it's toned down. It doesn't weaken the immune system. It modulates the immune system. The immune system can do what it needs to do, and then it quiets down to avoid autoimmune disease. And it seemed like 1,000 milligrams a day was the best dose. So if, if essential fatty acids modulate and keep the immune system from, over, from overdoing it, from running amok, it might be helpful in, in an autoimmune disease like exercise-induced asthma, which is we're seeing this with greater frequency. Here we're going to look at 20 ranked college athletes in the United Kingdom. 10 did not have exercise-induced asthma. 10 did. They'd get shorter breath with effort. It was more of a problem in the cold months. And there would be a 10% drop in their FEV1. That's forced expiratory volume in one second. You blow into a drum, and the rate at which you can blow out the air is a measure of are your, blood are your, are your bronchioles constricting or loose. And if the FEV1 is low, that means you're having an asthma attack. So you do a baseline assessment. Then you're going to give them 18 capsules a day over three weeks of olive oil placebo or um, 5,500 milligrams of EPA and DHA. And what you find, here we're going to measure plasma and urine leukotriene B4. Now this is a bad guy um, uh, prostaglandin that causes inflammation. And here, I don't know if you can see this very well, this is the amount of leukotriene at baseline and following exercise. So following exercise, there's inflammation, they're making leukotrienes, they're going to start wheezing. Here we have placebo therapy, there's no effect. Here we have fish oil. You can see that following exercise, plasma and urine, leukotriene does not rise. So that inflammatory mediator that wants to cause bronchoconstriction does not rise when you're taking fish oils. Plasma interleukin-1 beta, plasma tumor necrosis alpha, also, mediators of inflammation and bronchoconstriction, they also don't go up following exercise in the fish oil group. The FEV1, um, how much air you can expel. Here are the subjects at baseline, and here's following exercise or following exercise on placebo. So they're, they're bronchoconstricting and they're wheezing. They have effort-induced asthma. Here are the same athletes on fish oil. It doesn't happen. It blocked their effort to induce asthma by fixing the biochemistry. How many puffs of their inhaler did they need? 29 at baseline, 28 on placebo, 19 on fish oil. So fish oil is good in effort to induce asthma. Lycopene, an essential fatty acid, is also helpful. Let's talk about lupus. It is an autoimmune disease. Chronic disorder characterized by arthritis, rash, vasculitis, inflammatory damage to the nervous system, kidney, heart, and lungs. Women are much more likely to develop lupus and autoimmune disease in general than our men. This is one of the reasons that we should all enjoy being boys, because we're not as likely to get these autoimmune diseases. Now, there's something wrong with the immune system. The T cells that are the conductor of the immune orchestra are confused. They have trouble differentiating normal, healthy self cells from abnormal cells. They get confused, and they direct an immune system attack against our cells, autoimmune disease. The B cells make abnormal self-reactive antibodies that will deposit in your kidneys, your brains, or your joints. And that causes pro inflammatory prostaglandins to be elaborated, which causes much of the tissue damage. 
The disease is incurable because we don't even know why it exists. All we can do is blood inflammation and symptoms with aspirin, steroids, and Motrin's, or we can suppress the out-of-control immune system with immunosuppressive agencies like cancer chemotherapy. Not a really satisfactory regimen. Levels of several cytokines are abnormally elevated, interferon gamma, the interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, all four are pro-inflammatory. They attract white cells to the site of inflammation, stimulates the white cells to make more inflammatory mediators, free radicals, leukotrienes, inflammatory prostaglandins. So a vicious cycle develops, symptoms, organ system dysfunction, more inflammation that feeds upon itself, debility, and, and eventual death. Much of the tissue damage is due to free radicals, inflammatory prostaglandins, leukotrienes and cytokines, chemicals that this group understands from tonight and last week. Essential fatty acids block the production of inflammatory prostaglandins and leukotrienes, promote production of anti-inflammatory prostaglandins, inhibit production of inflammatory cytokines. Could omega-3 deficiency be a cause of lupus? Could supplementation be of value to lupus patients? Let's find out. 12 patients newly diagnosed lupus, you record their symptoms and, and, their, and their lab studies. You measure baseline levels of essential fatty acids, lipid peroxides, a marker of free radical stress, antioxidants, and nitric oxide, good guys. Treated for six months with six capsules a day, they get some D, some A, and about 1,500 milligrams of EPA and DHA. Those with harder kidney involvement got prednisone, a steroid, during months one and two, and then they stopped it, and it was just fish oils alone for the next six months. Now, here, let's look at the percent uh, representation of different essential fatty acids in the plasma. The patients were lower in EPA than were healthy controls, but if you supplement them, the percent EPA goes up. They were low in DHA versus healthy controls, but if you supplement, they go up. They were low in GLA versus healthy controls. If you supplement them, they go up. Now, we're giving them fish oil, we're not giving them GLA, but when you give one of the good essential fatty acids, it upregulates the expression of its beneficial cousin and downregulates expression of arachidonic acid, which was high and it fell. So these people have an essential fatty acid imbalance. They don't have good guys. They have too many of the bad guys. You supplement with fish oils. You can rectify the situation. Superoxide dismutase. Remember last week I showed you a slide, if you have a lot of superoxide dismutase, you don't get heart disease. If it's low, you get heart disease. It's an antioxidant enzyme. Um, the patients, their level was 4 versus healthy people, it's 14. They were low in this critical antioxidant enzyme. You give them fish oil, it goes up. Lipid peroxides are markers of free radical stress. They had higher levels of free radical stress. You give them fish oils, it falls. Nitric oxide is the most important chemical to the arteries. They were low in nitric oxide versus normal people. You give them fish oil, it goes up. Glutathione is our most important intracellular antioxidant. It's, it's key. They were low in glutathione. You give them fish oil, it goes up. So with fatty acid supplementation, arachidonic acid levels fall, and the anti-inflammatory omega-3 and omega-6 levels rise. Antioxidant enzymes are enhanced, lipid peroxides fall, nitric oxide and glutathione levels fall. Well, that's nice biochemistry. It makes me feel good that I'm doing something intelligent. But what, what happened to the patients? They all got better. They all went into complete remission. They were no longer sick. The, their problem was a disturbance in their biochemistry, a disturbance in essential fatty acids. That gave them the lupus. You get to them early. You fix the situation. They all went into remission. Now, these were all early, early patients without long-term debility. This wouldn't work in someone who'd had lupus for 15 years, but it sure worked in these patients. It just shows you the power of working with Mother Nature. Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease of the gut. Same basic concept as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Inflammatory prostaglandins, leukotrienes, all the bad guys are involved. Here we're going to take patients, 38 patients with Crohn's disease in remission, randomize them to a control diet, a diet rich in cold water fish. 58% of the control diet had a relapse versus only 20% of the high fish diet. Study was repeated, same basic results. Omega-3s in epilepsy. 
you know, a seizure is a disorder of the nerves of the brain, just as a cardiac arrhythmia is a disorder of the nerves of the heart. Fish oils are helpful in blocking cardiac arrhythmias, a seizure of the heart. How will they work in seizures of the brain? 21 hospitalized patients, predominantly brain-damaged kids with epilepsy, all on at least two seizure drugs. They're having at least three seizures a month. You make a bread spread for them rich in essential fatty acids. Now, 16 of the kids refused to eat the spread. They were all severely damaged. But they got five of the kids to take in the bread spread that was rich in essential fatty acids. And you can see the, the seizure frequency before to after. You know, some of them stopped having seizures because you improve the biochemistry of their, their, the nerves in their brain. It kind of makes sense. Um, a lot of people, a lot of psychiatric disease is really due to essential fatty acid prostaglandin imbalance. If you look at the red cell membrane fatty acid panel of people with psychiatric disease, it's often goofed up. Um, and depressed people are low in the good essential fatty acids, so could supplementation help? 28 patients with major depression, 26 were on drugs. You do the HAMD, the, that's a standardized rating scale, the Hamilton rating scale for depression. Treat them with 10 capsules twice a day, randomized to provide um, uh, 6,500 milligrams of EPN DHA or placebo. Their red blood cell um, uh, EPA and DHA rises, and their HAMD scale falls. They were less depressed. You fix the biochemical imbalance, their depression lifts. Um, essential fatty acids of peptic ulcer disease. Aspirin and non-steroidals like Motrin, we all know they can cause peptic ulcer disease. Aspirin and non-steroidals wipe out all prostaglandins. You want to wipe out the leukotrienes in the series 2. They're the ones causing pain, and aspirin and Motrin will do that, but they also wipe out the good series 1 and 3. That's how you get the side effects. Prostaglandins are made from essential fatty acids. Could peptic ulcer disease be due to or aggravated by an imbalance in essential fatty acids? 20, 32 patients with duodenal ulcers. They all have a gastroscopy showing the ulcer. None on aspirin or Motrin's. Treat them for six weeks. 16 received Pepsi. That is a drug that blocks the production of stomach acid. Um, 16 get um, 2,000 milligrams a day of EPA and DHA, and then you reevaluate it four to six weeks. And if we look at the percentage of um, fatty acids that are EPA, you can see the ulcer patients have half the EPA representation as do controls. When you give the max EPA, it rises dramatically. When you give them Pepsid, it rises a little bit. And the same relationship with DHA. So the peptic ulcer patients are low in fish oils and other fatty acids in their cell membranes. So what happens if you treat them? Um, healing of the duodenal ulcer. Um, um, Pepsid healed. Um, 75% of the ulcers at four weeks, and 88% at six weeks. That's the drug effect. Fish oils healed 60% of the ulcers at four weeks, and 80% at um, six weeks. Fish oil supplementation was almost as good as the drug. Why? The drug just blocks acid production, which is not healthy or physiologic, but allows the ulcer to heal by fixing the essential fatty acid imbalance that allowed the ulcer to occur in the first place the fish oils do a pretty good job as well of healing the ulcer. Essential fatty acids in the prostate. 15 men scheduled for a repeat prostate biopsy. Why were they having a repeat biopsy? They had an elevated PSA, the prostate marker, and the previous biopsy had shown high-grade dysplasia or a typical small glands. That's the equivalent to an abnormal but non-cancerous pap smear. The doctor will treat you try to fix the situation, repeat the pap smear, and make sure it's going in the right direction. So these men had the, the equivalent of an abnormal pap smear in their prostate. So they're at high risk to go on to cancer. You do baseline lab studies, and you look at the rate at which their prostate cells proliferate. The more rapidly they proliferate, the more likely they are to turn cancerous. So you put them on an experimental diet. Ground flaxseed, three tablespoons a day, that'll give you um, alpha linoleic acid, and a lot of fiber. Low-fat diet, no antibiotics. Antibiotics appear to have an adverse effect on prostate cancer. No change in meds or supplements. You re it at six months. <coughs> now, these lignans, these are the fibers in flaxseed. 
they do a lot of good for you. They block the enteropathic recycling of testosterone and estradiol. So they modulate the expression of estradiol and testosterone, which is why they're also helpful in lowering your risk of breast cancer. Same basic physiology. They increase sex hormone binding globulin, which will bind up this testosterone to the estradiol. They inhibit 5-alpha reductase that converts testosterone to the DHT. That's the one that really stimulates the prostate. They affect intracellular signaling. They reduce IGF-1, which is a hormone that may cause abnormal proliferation of the prostate. Now, what did they find? The testosterone level fell slightly at six months. The cholesterol fell a lot from 241 to 213. Their PSAs fell from 8.5 to 5.7, a real positive sign. You don't want to have a high PSA. They repeated the biopsies in most of them. The proliferation rate of the cells was 0.022 at baseline, and it was one-third of that on flaxseed. So it's sort of decelerating the rate at which these cells divide, which would have a beneficial effect, you'd think, on cancer. They repeat the biopsy in 13 of the 15. In two of the men, they, they canceled the repeat biopsy. Why? Because their PSA normalized. And they figured that's kind of a dumb idea to do a biopsy. The flaxseed had fixed the problem. Premalignant findings were present in all 15 of these men at baseline. Now, three of the 13 that had biopsy went on to carcinoma, which is not a surprise. Four of the 13 had, had stable findings at six months. In six, the histology, the microscopic appearance, had reverted to non-threatening, as in a pap smear going back to normal. So this ground flaxseed regimen lowered the PSA and improved the appearance of the prostate biopsies, reverting many of the men back to a normal prostate. Seems like a pretty good idea. Another benefits of essential fatty acid supplementation. We'll close with um, a discussion of alpine health cheese. Now, we've been saying dairy products are bad because they're full of saturated fats. But really, you know, the, the fatty acid content of milk or cheese from an animal is solely a function of that animal's diet. And if that animal is eating um, a lot of good essential fatty acids, her uh, milk and cheese will be full of good essential fatty acids. So it's kind of like we are, you, you get what they eat. Now, longevity has been attributed to people who eat these alpine dairy products. Why? Here we're going to measure the fatty acid content of various cheeses. Cows, you know, from, from milk obtained from cows with outdoor grazing in the Swiss Alps, they're eating a lot of grasses that's full of essential fatty acids. Or um, cows with partial grazing, partial silage feeding, an industrial produced emmental type cheese, or an English cheddar. And if you look at the, the percentage, the amount of alpha linoleic acid, it's much greater in the grazed animals that are eating a lot of grass than in this, this cheaper type of cheese. You'll get more omega-3s. The omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is lower, which is good. And they looked at how many grams of omega-3 you would get in a fondue meal. And if you get it from the cheese from the grazed animals, that was beneficial. So it's not just cheese is bad. It has to do with you know, what type of animal the cheese and the dairy product came from and what they ate. <coughs> so the benefits of fish oil and cardiovascular disease. The lipid panel improves. The HDL rises. Triglycerides and LPA falls. LDL particle size increases. Coagulation profile improves. Fibrinogen and PI-1 falls. Platelet aggregation, platelet monocyte aggregation is blunted. Homocysteine falls. Endothelial function improves. Angina frequency and nitroglycerin requirement decrease. Treadmill time improves. Your arteries show less disease progression at two years. And that translates, along with the physiologic changes, to protection from future adverse events, less vein graft closure following bypass, restenosis decreased following angioplasty, improved cardiac autonomic function, decrease in PVC frequency, protection with ventricular arrhythmia, protection against sudden death, preventative and therapeutic in atrial fib, major reduction in post-heartache mortality, multiple non-cardiovascular benefits. The downsides, if you take the essential fatty acids, they could be oxidized, so take them with antioxidants. Um, we will hold your fish oils before neurosurgery. Fish oils don't cause abnormal bleeding, but there are times when you want to be a really good clotter. 
um, giving you too much fish oil can cause an omega-6 deficiency, so we're going to supplement you with both. We want to watch the vitamin A intake, mercury content of fish, your insurance coverage company won't cover it, and of course, it's bad for my procedure volume, and I know you're all very worried about that. <laughs> eliminate trans fats from your diet. They're the metabolic poison. If all I get you to do is eliminate trans fats, I'm going to decrease your likelihood of dying of cardiovascular disease over the remaining years by 50%. Minimize saturated fat. It's not good for us. Make room in your stomach for unrefined trans fat free vegetable oils. Cook with olive oil. Two to three fish meals a week or 1,000 milligrams of fish oil and get some gamolinic acid or you can take a blend. If you have active cardiovascular disease, we're going to give you higher doses. Um, what type of fish should you eat? The cold water ocean fish are rich in the good essential fatty acids. Mackerel, sardine, lake trout, um, swordfish and lobster unfortunately are not helpful. Um, now, what type of salmon, what type of fish should you eat? Again, I talked about how cheese, whether it's good or bad, has to do with what the cow ate. Same thing with the fish that we eat. Here we're going to take 60 subjects with known coronary disease, baseline lab studies, we're going to randomize them to receive 700 grams a week of farm salmon. And this farm salmon was raised on fish oil as their, their fatty acid source. Another group of fish in another tank got 50% fish oil, 50% rapeseed oil. Another group got 100% rapeseed oil. So the cardiac patients eat this fish that was raised on different types of oils. And then you repeat the lab studies. The omega-3 to omega-6 ratio increased only in the patients that ate the fish that was raised on fish oil. It fell in the others. Triglycerides fell only in the patients that ate the fish that were raised on fish oil. VCAM1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, bad guys fell in the fish oil group. So if you're eating farm salmon that is fed junk, you're not going to get a benefit. Okay, so if you're going to eat farm salmon, you want to know what those fish ate. We have a problem um, with, um, with the, the, the fish in the grocery store. A lot of it is contaminated with mercury, and they're, they're not going to tell you the truth. They're not going to measure the amount of mercury, but anything coming out of the Great Lakes, do not eat it. It is so loaded with mercury, it's definitely bad for you, especially if you're a young lady who may become pregnant because that mercury is going to be transferred right across the placenta. Huge problem. So what type of fish can we eat? Um, well, there's, there's an interest here, and there's a few companies that market mercury-free fish. And there's a company called Vital Choice, vitalchoice.com. My colleague, Dr. Steven Sinatra, has checked these people out. He's convinced they're on the level. Most of the commercial fisheries, they're going to go deep into the ocean. They want to get big fish, because that's more economical. The bigger the fish, the more mercury. They are doing coastal fishing. They're getting small salmon and small fish that haven't been around long enough to pick up a lot of mercury. They also process them better. They don't soak them in salt. They flash freeze them immediately. So if you want to eat fish, get it from Vital Choice, vitalchoice.com, or a similar uh, company. Um, now, how much fish oil should you take? One thing that I'm going to recommend is going with liquid fish oil or cod liver oil. It is much more cost effective. One tablespoon of cod liver oil gives you as much good stuff as 8 to 12 gel caps. If you just won't take the cod liver oil, you can take ethyl ester EPA, which is something we have for our patients. It's like a double strength fish oil. 1,000 milligrams of regular fish oil gives you about 250 milligrams of EPA and DHA. This stuff gives you about 600, but still, the most effective way is to take cod liver oil. But you're always complaining about the taste. And I say, it's not that bad. You can get this cod liver oil that is flavored, and it doesn't taste that bad. And to demonstrate, I will take in a big heaping tablespoon of cod liver oil in your presence here. Mmm. <laughs> Delightful bouquet. So if I can take this stuff, you can take this stuff, because you want to take this stuff, because you don't want to become one of my patients. Because if you do become one of my patients, I'm going to force you to take all this stuff. Because what I really want to see, I want to make sure there's something fishy going on in your heart. 
that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention.